Today's video is brought to you by my fantastic patrons. Pledge today to not only have your name appear at the end of these videos, but also have your say on what video comes to my channel next. Link in the description. Series 8 was met with poor reception, so Hit's reboot of Thomas and Friends was not off to a great start. But it didn't stop them from producing both a feature-length special to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Railway series, and an all-new series of Thomas and Friends, both at the exact same time. In 2005, during the release period of the director dvd and VHS release of Calling All Engines, if not days before it came out, we were treated to the ninth series of Thomas and Friends. During the production of Series 9, Hit faced financial issues with their toy stock in the United States, so to avoid any severe loss of Wonga, they were bought out by Apex Partners, who would remain their owners until the Mattel buyout years later in 2012. That is literally the only interesting thing I could find regarding Series 9's production. Beggars can't be choosers, I guess. Another thing worth noting is that this was the first series where the writing staff established since Series 6 featured the contributions of Sharon Miller, who had previously only written the learning segments of Series 8, and was now a script editor and writer. The episode Thomas and the Birthday Picnic marks her story debut in the franchise. The rest of the team remain virtually the same, same director, producer, composer, blah 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 blah. Series 9 marks the first series to introduce brand new characters not conceptualised by the original Brit Allcroft team, as well as marked the return of the Scar Lowy railway engines who were absent during Series 8's run, unless you count the two Series 7 episodes that played in between Series 8 ones, as well as featured two new characters for said railway, the thin controller Mr Percival, originally a railway series character even the classic series didn't feature, and an all new engine, Mighty Mac. Famously, this character was a scrapped concept for Series 6, originally named Little Giant, whose unique design was based on the Double Farley engine from the Festiniog Railway in Wales. He was repurposed into Mighty Mac, the first non-Audrey narrow-gauge engine since Smudger. <laughs> this series also featured an episode that was nominated for a BAFTA, Thomas and the Rainbow. This series aired towards the end of 2005, again around the time of Calling All Engines was released. Specifically, that special came out between episodes 10 and 11, Reneus and the Dinosaur and Thomas and the New Engine respectively. Same half hour format as the previous series, same channels, same everything. I actually remember when this series first debuted on Nick Jr, as in, I remember the day I saw that brand new opening segment. It filled me with a sense of excitement, wondering what was going to be next, after Series 8 was slowly starting to put me off the show. Then they bored me again. Like before, I hadn't watched Series 9 in its entirety for years before this review series, so how does it do? Did it fix or at least remove any of the problems from Series 8? Or do we have another lifeless addition to a babyfied version of Thomas the Tank Engine? Eh... <laughs> this is the most indifferent, middle-of-the-road Thomas and Friends series I have ever seen up to this point. Like, it's better than Series 8, it's not that terrible, but 
it's not that great either. I have incredibly mixed feelings towards it with everything that it did great, bad and just... okay? <laughs> and I probably should have stressed this at the start of reviewing the hit series, but if you have fond memories of series 9 and the hit series overall, that's absolutely fine. I'm glad that you enjoy this era, I'm just stating how I feel. And for those of you that are waiting a long time for this series review, I thank you for your patience, and I only hope that I can give you the answers you were looking for. So, let us begin. My biggest problem when looking at Series 8 was that it felt too restrained in its storytelling compared to what came before. And while that issue is kind of true for Series 9, as they don't get too creative with what stories they tell, the great stories they do have to tell feel like a noticeable step up. Allow me to demonstrate as I compare the first episode of Series 8, Thomas and the Tuba, with the first episode of this series, Percy and the Oil Painting. Thomas and the Tuba features characters behaving like brain-dead idiots, including the main lead as Thomas runs like a panicking child around the island looking for the tuba player, who is continually taking time-wasting detours around the island instead of just, you know, waiting for Thomas to come back. There he is! It is a dumb concept that would be over in a matter of moments if characters applied any common sense, but is instead dragged out for several minutes. With the moral of slow down and use your ears dipshit spelt out in capital letters with a megaphone. Percy and the oil painting, on the other hand, takes what would become a repetitive formula for the franchise and tells an entertaining story of Percy becoming increasingly annoyed with a snobby famous artist. His outburst at the artist is understandable, it subverts our expectations with how the story concludes, and the pacing is intentionally repetitive to keep building and building the artist as an asshole. The moral of, it's important to stand up for your beliefs against those who seem untouchable, is told naturally. It was a very smart choice to make this the opening episode of the series, as it sets the bar high for everyone watching, and draws them in to stick around for the next one. And lo and behold, we do get some episodes with creative ideas and decent structure. Mighty Mac tackles a very unique concept of basically two guys stuck together figuratively and literally who must learn to cooperate with each other, otherwise they'll just end up going back and forth and back and forth all the time. Respect for Gordon, I feel, needs no introduction, as a great episode that tackles how respect for one another is earned instead of demanded, while also showing both sides of the characters in the conflict are right and wrong in their own way, Thomas and the New Engine tackles the broken telephone game scenario, where rumours around the New Engine Neville, started by Thomas, become further and further from the truth when it's passed from engine to engine. Thomas's day off gives its spin on the Boy Who Cried Wolf story, as another New Engine, Dennis, tricks Thomas into doing his jobs for him, not out of malice, but just because he's lazy. Only for when he actually does need help, there's no one around to help him. You also get Duncan and the Old Mine, an adventurous type story as Duncan gets himself stuck in a mine shaft. An episode that really doesn't shy away from the fears of isolation in a dark and cramped place. In fact, looking back on Series 9 as a whole, there's a whole bunch of episodes around characters venturing into dark and misty unknown adventures. We got Duncan venturing into an old mine, and we've also got Peter Sam in The Magic Lamp. <laughs> Did someone say magic? No more. As he searches for a mysterious lamp to guide him through the darkness as well as Thomas in Bold and Brave as he helps Ben through a spooky tunnel thinking there's a monster inside, which helps him conquer his own fears later on, when he comes to some cliffside tracks covered in mist thinking they are cursed, and Thomas again in Flower Power being scared by things he can't make out in the darkness of Sodor on Halloween, all thanks to Diesel teasing him, only for him to scare Diesel back, meaning he has to deliver the flower all on his own, 
and face his fears, venturing past everything he was made to believe was scary. It feels kind of similar to Series 5 in that regard, with how that series had a lot of stories set in dark and scary places. Both series even have episodes where it's Duncan getting scared by the dark. Granted, the stories here don't go nearly as dark or serious as where Series 5 went, but it's nice to see the franchise continue to honour its spooktacular roots. But even some of the episodes with interesting concepts have major drawbacks that can jolly well do one. Thomas and the New Engine has Thomas taking a dislike to the New Engine Neville because he misreads a situation thinking he's friends with Ari and Bert, and all the engines who hear this rumour share the suspicion as diesels are not to be trusted. It's a good thing they didn't create any feature length production to show steam engines and diesels putting their differences aside and learning to work together. Oh, oh hang on a goddamn minute, they did! and they reset as soon as the next series started. The status quo, everybody. Consistency? Forget about it. They all knew that steamies and diesels are different, but they both like to pull trucks and carriages, and they both love to be really useful. But we'd better be careful. I saw them at the yards with Ari and Bert. They were laughing together. I know his type. Racist. The magic lamp has the oh-so-lovable three strikes formula, with Peter Sam going through the three hints of the magic lamp being near him three separate times, and it only looks to make the episode feel dragged out rather than scary. And flower power just has me baffled as to why they have a hopper for loading trucks with flour rather than just, you know, carrying it in sacks? It's not coal, you know, it's an ingredient that has to be kept clean as it's used to make food. Oh wait, they did it so the kids can clearly see what his trucks are carrying because they're stupid. Great job, guys. I can only say I enjoyed 7 of the 26 episodes in this entire series. The rest are either just okay, or just awful with baffling childish story elements and obvious morals from yesteryear. The Gimmick of the Week episodes were not that prominent in Series 8, but that didn't make them any less babyish. Here, however, is when these gimmicks really start to assert their dominance. Thomas's milkshake muddle having him deliver milk and butter to the returning ice cream factory and the bakery. Thomas and the toy shop focusing around opening a toy shop within a train station. The skeleton of a dinosaur, a birthday picnic, a fun fair, presents in open trucks. Like, do we need the engines for these types of stories? What happened to the times when stories had things that made sense to be carried by a train, and the conflict came from overcoming obstacles like braving a flood to get a Sunday school home, saving workmen from a rock slide, delivering fish with more trucks than an engine is used to, saving the railway from closing by working through a jammed valve gear? Give me those stories. And then we get to the BAFTA nominated episode, Thomas and the Rainbow. Out of all of the episodes from this series, and the ones that came before, how in the world was this nominated for a BAFTA? It's barely a story! So Thomas has to take engineers to fix telephone poles that have been knocked over. He sees a rainbow, and hears from Edward something magical is said to be found at the end of one. He decides, the poor sods can't stop me, and begins chasing it, abandoning his duties. Every time someone tries to talk to him, he barely acknowledges them and continues chasing the rainbow. And instead of just rolling their eyes, his friends are sad he's ignoring them. Then, oh no, Thomas comes off the rails because of not keeping a good lookout, and he thinks nobody wants to help him when he thinks Percy ignores his call for help. But in fact, Percy does not ignore him, and instead of going straight to Harvey, tells Henry, who tells Bertie, who tells the children, who all tell James, who tells Harold, who then tells Harvey. Turning three lefts to make a right turn there, you dipshits. Thomas is lifted back onto the track and completes his jobs, only for him to return to the sheds and find the end of the rainbow. There is something magical at the end of a rainbow. My friends, friends are the most wonderful thing of all. I'm so sorry. I, 
I haven't cried this much since the last time I watched a few good mengins. And my god, could these morals be any more spoon-fed? You know, Mac, wish mighty, when we pull together and work together, we can be a very useful engine. Thomas has shown me that being a really useful engine is much better than being really lazy. They were both pleased to be friends again, and they both agreed that working with your friend is the best job of all. Edward! He puffed. I will learn to take care just like you. Christ, even if these episodes don't follow the dreaded three strike formula all the time, the manner in which the stories are told is just so... flat. If you spoon feed the morals, it leaves nothing for the audience to think about afterwards. They know the moral now, so why should they go back to watch it? Certainly not for any memorable scenes, because once again, many of these episodes drag out to fit the 7 minute runtime. I legit forgot so many story beats from episodes like Thomas and the Golden Eagle, Toby feels left out, and Thomas tries his best, right after I just watched them because they were so brain dead. In fact, wait a minute, in Thomas tries his best, Thomas is stuck pulling Farmer McCall's chickens while missing out on going somewhere exciting like the fair. That's almost the exact same story as Thomas gets it right from the last season, only with chickens instead of eggs. But we know the eggs came first this time! Okay, uh, anything left with the stories? There's a bit in Thomas's milkshake muddle that shows two loaded trains of milk, which definitely don't give away he's going to mess up one of them and then come back for the other one. This milk is almost butter! exclaimed the manager. Oh my, what a twist! How could I have not seen this coming? Oh, they did another story on Henry's love for nature with Henry and the flagpole where Henry does what he can to prevent a pine tree from being cut down by finding a replacement flagpole. This one was... Uh, okay. Like, better than Henry and the Wishing Tree last series, but still just kinda there and had some weird moments. Hello, Henry. You're very nice, Trevor, puffed Henry, but you wouldn't make a very good flagpole. Okay. Oh, speaking of weird, the scene where the engines try whistling Happy Birthday to Dowager Hats felt a bit awkward. Okay. Oh yeah, they brought back the Fat Controller's mother for an episode. That was... nice, even if said episode was a bit shit. Speaking of Dowager Hats, let's move on to the characters. Alrighty, new series, new characters. The first new characters from Hit Entertainment. What do I think of them? Eh. The best character of the roster is definitely Mighty Mac. Introducing who is essentially a conjoined twins character is something you wouldn't expect for Thomas and Friends, but then when you think about it for a moment, it actually makes a lot of sense. There are several multi-engine steam locomotive designs throughout history, and so making them characters where each part of the engine is independent and have to work together to get jobs done opens the door for so many storytelling opportunities unique to being a steam engine. And his titular episode… kind of does that. It is fairly predictable as Mighty and Mac each fight over which direction they need to take the holiday makers. They get lost, fight over it, and cause an accident by derailing the coach. But hey, rather than the thin controller turning up and saying they have caused confusion and delay, the passengers actually work together in getting the coach back onto the rails, and that inspires Mighty and Mac to work together to push the rocks aside to clear the tracks. Plus one to Paul Larson for not falling into the confusion and delay trap. The only thing that's a letdown about Mighty Mac is that this is his only spotlight episode throughout the rest of the series, and the last episode to treat Mighty and Mac as separate characters. <laughs> like, what the fuck? They did one episode tackling the concept of his design, and then they were just like, okay, no more, that's it. <laughs> Why introduce him in the first one? Oh. Now on to Molly. Aside from appearing before her debut episode as a cameo in Thomas's milkshake model, oops, she's an engine who desires to pull a more important train than just empty trucks after Emily laughs at her. Ooh, hoo, 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 boy, I have plenty to say about that bitch later on. 
there's not much to talk about with Molly, simply because the episode doesn't really do much with her, and like Mighty Mac, she doesn't really appear again afterwards. Like, she wants to feel important, Thomas comes up with a trick to fool the engines into thinking she's pulling a special train, oh wait, I'm sorry, a special special, Blech. so babyish. Then the wind reveals her trucks are empty, Molly runs away in shame, it turns out her trucks are important after all, god, even recapping this episode, I've nothing to say about it. They kind of set up something with how Gordon believes Molly's train isn't as important as the Express, but all that results in is Gorton getting stopped at a signal to let her and Thomas pass at the end of the episode. They could have done something with this dynamic, which I would like to go into detail about one day, but for now, yeah, quite the wasted potential. I have absolutely nothing on Neville. The only thing I can gather from his personality is that he is upset about being scowled at by the engines for doing nothing wrong, but then of course he would. He pulls Annie and Clarabelle, which makes Thomas crosser, but then that doesn't go anywhere either. You do feel kind of sympathetic for him with how he's laughed at by the diesels and then by the rest of the steam engines making him seem alone. The scene where he nearly falls off the broken bridge is tense but kind of empty because we don't really know him as a character. If his entire purpose was to be a tool for this story of misunderstood rumours, he works, but he has a blank slate despite having an awesome design and a cracking Tommy train design if I do say so myself. Then you've got Dennis. He too has a really cool design, and actually is the most memorable of the new standard gauge engines because he actually has an arc. He's a lazy guy who just doesn't want to do his jobs, and so takes advantage of the more willing to help engines like Thomas, even though it's his day off. I'd argue a proper day off for an engine would be resting in the shed all day, but hey ho, hit era standards of writing, we move along. He gets himself into an accident and there's no one around to help him, in a style similar to the boy who cried wolf mentioned before. And when help does come, he admits to his tricks. I love that when Dennis is telling the truth, the camera just cuts to Thomas who doesn't say anything, but he just has that face that screams, THIS LAZY MOTHERFUCKER! <laughs> it's, it's so in character for Thomas, and I always look forward to that when I rewatch this episode. Unlike Molly and Neville getting cameos, however, Dennis does not appear at all until the near end of the hit model series, with one single shot in The Great Discovery. Again, you'd think they would have done more with his character, and lo and behold, the fandom years later would take this character and give their own spin on Dennis. But nope, nothing from Hit. That's just sad. It's also worth noting the introduction of Mr. Peregrine Percival, the Thin Controller who is the first Railway Series character brought into the TV series since Tom Tipper in Series 4's Mind That Bike. And like with the TV Series Fat Controller, his name is completely separate to the other Thin Controllers from the Railway Series. While the Fat Controller drives a car, he rides a bicycle. It's never addressed, but it's there. So what's his personality? He's the Scar Lowy Railway's Fat Controller, but minus the food jokes. That's it. I didn't really know what else to expect, since there was never really any difference between the two controllers in the books either, despite their different families and running different railways. He's fine. Nothing more, nothing less. We also have Proteus. It was nice to see the narrow gauge engines back after their absence in the last series, and like with series 7, each one of them gets an episode to play the main lead. However, their quality definitely varies this time around. Remember how Scar, Louis and Reneus became less confident in themselves and became quite childish in Series 7? Specifically Reneus on the roller coaster and the old bridge? Well, this time around their childlike demeanours are turned up to a frustrating 110. Reneus and the dinosaur have the two falling out over getting to pull a dinosaur skeleton on a flatbed. Two of the wisest and oldest engines on the island, and they're fighting over a dinosaur. God, this is like watching two honourable wise old men fighting over the TV remote or who gets the first coffee. It's so embarrassing. The lesson they learn of it's good to share and work together is one they should definitely already know, and it's just... just so ridiculous. Not as ridiculous, however, as Scar Louie the Brave, where Scar Louie wants to show his friends just how brave he really is, and so doesn't get uncoupled from the incline winch, and gets pulled all the way up said incline, which leads to the winch breaking, and... Whee! 
puffed skull lower as he raced down the hill. You're on, you, you, it's like your brain, your brain doesn't fucking work, you, you, you idiot. You're honestly an idiot. I don't know what's, I don't know what's wrong with you. Yeah, just vandalising valuable equipment to your railway is so fitting for you, isn't it, Skull Lowey? And learning that you have to put your work before doing silly, dangerous things. God, what went wrong? Rusty is notably different this time around, not just with consistently being mistaken as a steam engine rather than a diesel with the incorrect terminologies. They puff and chuff all day up and down the hills. But he too has regressed into a child. The episode Tuneful Toots has him taking a brass band all around the railway and he uses it as an opportunity to show off his two-tone horn, which the other engines mock him for. So Rusty doesn't keep track of time as he takes the band around and so runs out of diesel oil on the way back. But it's okay, his irresponsibility is rewarded when the band's music and his horn lead the engines and the thin and fat controller to him so they can have the concert by the lake instead. Accountability for your actions be damned. Also, early recordings of the US dub refer to Rusty as female. Rusty's favourite journey was by the lake. She liked to toot her horn there. The sound echoed around the hills. Rusty was coming down the hill with freight cars full of coal. She stopped when she saw Duncan. Oh, look what you've done, Duncan, she hooted. Why did you break through the barrier? But this wasn't the first time Rusty wasn't referred to as he, technically, as an interview with Britt Allcroft states that, for Rusty's introduction in Series 4, she wanted the character to be gender-neutral, and changed any mention of Rusty being referred to as male from the books. Did Rusty help you off your truck? Yes. He says he's come to mend the line and do our jobs. I like him. I see you've met Rusty, said Peter Sam. Yes, I like that diesel. Send him packing! Send him packing! Snorted Duncan. Send Rusty packing! Send Rusty packing! Snorted Duncan. And to my bewilderment, there's no referring to Rusty as a male throughout the rest of the other series either. The only exception, I guess, being Michael Brandon's notably male voice for him. Don't use the old wooden bridge, said Rusty. It's dangerous. I've no idea where the change to refer to him as male came from, but as recently revealed to the general public, the leaked Hit Entertainment Writer's Bible from 2003 describes Rusty as female, which is probably where these mentions in Tuneful Toots and Duncan and the Old Mind come from. But from here on out, Rusty was male, which is why I had been referring to him as he throughout the rest of this review series. But yeah, that aside, he's just a regressed child like Skull, Louis, and Reneus. The only two narrow gauge engines who are probably the most consistent with their previous incarnations are Peter Sam and Duncan. Peter Sam seems a little bit meaner than usual when he disses Rusty's horn, but his lead episode, The Magic Lamp, is kind of interesting to see him be the skeptic to what he thinks are magic make believe stories. I swear, The Magic Lamp leaves me feeling all sorts of mixed. The Three Strikes formula makes the story feel like a drag to watch, but the fact that the mystery of Proteus is never made out to be true or not is interesting, and it is cool getting to see a new side of Peter Sam, as he continuously denies the magic only to slowly give in the more and more he gets lost. There's even a nice scene between him and Harold as he guides him through the fog with his lamp, two characters you wouldn't expect to see interact at all. They even reused Peter Sam's miniature model from the classic series for their conversation when Harold is on the ground. That's cute. Then we have Duncan, who might be THE most consistent character of the Narrow Gauge engines, and the one instance where the more childlike portrayal of him actually kind of works. He takes a dislike to Rusty's horn, but it's not because he's a diesel. He and the others just don't like the sound of it, which I think is a calibre above how he was portrayed in Series 7's Trusty Rusty. He acts all wide-eyed and curious towards the story of Proteus's lamp, and you know what? He probably would after he thought he saw a ghost and Duncan get spooked. That incident scared him so much he now believes any magic story told to him. Like, that is both tragic and hilarious. <laughs> and as out of character as it is for Skull Lowey going up the incline, Duncan saying he's a brave engine when clearly he's just being reckless is surprisingly fitting for him. It's like the thrill-seeking kid in class egging someone on to do something they know they shouldn't. And given what similarly happened with Duncan back in Series 6's Duncan Duncan, 
You can kinda see why he'd think that makes Skarloey brave. And finally we come to his starring role episode, Duncan and the Old Mine. His careless, looking out for anything that benefits for him attitude is on full display here. The scene where he breaks through the barrier and Rusty tells him off, only for Rusty to head back to work and we cut to that iconic devilish smile. You just know he's not gonna stop until he gets what he's after, which is an adventure in the caves. And indeed he gets one, but it ends up being more than he bargained for as the roof collapses trapping him inside. This was the first time a story in the series featured a character getting stuck in a mine and, even though it was his own fault, you still feel scared with the position he's in and hope he makes it out. And unlike every other Duncan story up to this point, where he is reprimanded for his reckless behaviour, he finds his own way out of the problem he caused and escapes the mine. He's told he was lucky to get out of the mine, but everyone is just pleased he's okay instead of the whole you've caused confusion and delay cliché. That was honestly so refreshing to see, and Duncan being in character throughout the whole episode helps to make it one of the better ones from Series 9 and the era in general. The Scarlowy Railway engines may have been mostly done dirty in their return, but at least Hit's got two of them right. Finally, we come to the main Steam team, and they're about the same as the last series, with small standout moments. Some good, some shit. Gordon is still grumpy and boastful, holding himself in a position only to be knocked down a peg, but his lead episode, Respect for Gordon, turns this trend on its head when the engines feel bad for teasing him when they do his work while he's at the works, and when he comes back, they all reach a common ground that every engine in the shed equally deserves respect. I also really like that in Percy and the oil painting, he hears that Percy is going to show the famous artist the spirit of Sodor, and he does not belittle him or say he's not fit for the job. I talked about this in my video looking at this episode, but this would have taken place after Gordon takes charge, where Percy shows how much he's learned from Gordon about pulling passenger trains. So it's like he's a proud older brother knowing Percy is the right engine for the job. It's just so wholesome. James gets a few episodes to be his smug, vain, ego-boosted self, and I like that in each scenario, he does and doesn't come out on top. In Thomas's new trucks, he shows off just how clean he can keep his new trucks to Thomas, which causes Thomas to use his old trucks instead, and he has an accident as a result. So James seems on top at first, until his trucks hold him back, and Cranky drops a crate of melons on him. Now he's on equal grounds with Thomas, who tells James trucks prefer being dirty as the episode ends. Keeping up with James is a James and Edward story, where James keeps trying to finish the job quickly to get the chance to pull the presence train, which causes him to slip across the icy rails and crash into the snow. So he seems to be knocked down a peg, but makes up for it when he offers to be Edward's back engine for the presence train, who shows him how to run the train safely. So he ends the episode on equal grounds with Edward, it's the right balance of one day his vanity gets the better of him, and another it happens again, but he redeems himself afterwards. Other than that, he and Gordon didn't really do anything noteworthy this series. While I love what they did with Percy in Percy and the Oil Painting, and his few moments of him being cheeky and blunt were pretty good. Rattler Gordon's keeping it all awake! Keep Percy. Percy, Percy, I think the statue is of me. Really, Samish, go on, Percy. That's nice. He didn't really have a lot of standout moments this series, at least to me. I'd argue that aside from his single lead episode, this is the first time he's really been pushed into the background since his introduction back in series one. Toby and Edward, however, oh boy, this time around they really start to feel different from their classic series counterparts, both even going through the same crisis. Toby worries he'll be put in a museum, so does a crap ton of jobs to be a really useful engine and keeps running away from the fat controller. Edward begins wheezing and can't pull a goods train, so Thomas pulls the train in his place so the fat controller doesn't find out as he worries about being sent for scrap. Look, there's nothing wrong with writing a story where a steam engine fears their obsolescence, but please, just use characters who would have genuinely believed this. Not the oldest, wisest dudes on the island. And if you're going to do it regardless, make the stakes feel believable for crying out loud. If you're going to tackle the dark concept of engines fearing they'll be scrapped, don't dance around it for the sake of your audience. Make their fears plausible. 
at least they both had one scene true to their characters. Edward knowing about the folklore of the rainbows feels fitting that he would know that, and we get a very good Toby moment where he laughs at Emily thinking she knows best. You have to be clever to be a queen, he said wisely, and know the right thing to do. I always know what to do, huffed Emily. Toby laughed. Speaking of Emily, the bitch is back. Ignorant to her own capabilities and wants to act like a queen just so she can tell Percy what to do. Which leads to... Yeah, that. As mentioned before, she laughs at Molly for pulling empty trucks. She tells Neville to fuck off after hearing rumours of him befriending the Diesels. And guess what? In Thomas's milkshake muddle, she's not just mean, she's an instigator. She insults Thomas for pulling trucks of milk churns and goads him into racing to the next signal. Which leads to Thomas messing the milk up, potentially meaning the bakers won't have any butter to make cakes. Yeah, Thomas was to blame for not slowing down and causing the churns to shake and ruin the milk, but Emily got him to his boiling point and she doesn't face the consequences for what she did, as she doesn't appear for the rest of the episode. Isn't this exactly how you wanted to see her ever since her Series 7 debut? I'm sorry I took Annie and Clarabelle. And I'm sorry I was so cross, replied Thomas. Friends? Friends. If you weren't a slow coach, Emily sniffed, the fat controller would have given you my job. I'm fast and reliable. That's why I'm taking the children. Piss off! Henry, he's fine. His spotlight episode, Henry and the Flagpole, as I mentioned before, was decent, and at least this time he's not incapable of pulling passenger trains. Seeing his caring side for the forest as he tries to protect the pine tree was... nice. And he also had some little moments of his irritable but caring side throughout the rest of Series 9. Like how he's the first one to mention how hard it is doing Gordon's job in respect for Gordon. It's hard work pulling the express. In Thomas and the Toy Shop, his track is blocked by a fallen crate and he's not overly sad, just very grumpy about it. Then when Thomas tries to pull both Henry's train of toys and Annie and Clarabelle to no avail over Gordon's Hill, Henry arrives still notably grumpy but ready to help. So that bit at the end where he and Thomas are together at the grand opening of the shop, he doesn't say a word but is much happier to have made the children's day by saving the shop. This episode was a pleasant surprise for me. I went in expecting it to be another Three Strikes Formula Thomas episode and instead I got a decent Thomas and Henry story. That, with a few tweaks here and there, especially with the beginning, I can see this being a great episode for the series. Oh yeah, speaking of Thomas, he's now in every episode. The circle is now complete, and will only continue to get worse as we go along, trust me. There is the problem once again with how he's impatient, irresponsible and childlike in many of his lead roles, but then he's also the role model? Like when Henry is looking for a new flagpole, or when Mighty Mac needs navigation advice. Look at where you want to go, then follow the track that will take you there. Well, duh. He does have moments true to his character. That one face he pulls at Dennis is still my favourite moment of him from the series. And I particularly like his role in Bold and Brave. He is scared by Diesel into thinking there is a curse on the cliffs beside the tracks, but still acts as the brave engine to help Ben through a scary tunnel. Yeah, Ben. Just Ben without his twin Bill. I think this is the first time we've seen a story with the twins separated from each other, which is probably part of why he feels so scared. Thomas isn't a fearless hero in this instance, but him facing his fears inspires Ben to do the same like a real role model should be. And that helps him fight his own battles later as he overcomes the fear of the fog surrounding the cliffs. Another pretty great episode in my opinion. But he's just so... back and forth with his portrayal. Some of his lead episodes are just so skippable, to a point where I don't want anything to do with any of those episodes. They're just so boring. Thomas and the Toy Shop being the only exception. So yeah, that's all I have to say about the characters. Returning characters like Dowager Hat, Bill and Ben were just kind of there, more so Bill than Ben. The Series 6 newbies didn't really get a whole lot to do. The Series 7 newbies are nowhere to be seen, other than this bitch. And Diesel is just the same old, same old with his only appearance in Flower Power. Overall, the new characters this time around were done... okay. And many of the old ones had their good moments, but were overall the same disappointing regressions as last time. 
Going from series 8 to 9, it's less noticeable than going from series 7 to 8, obviously. So it probably doesn't sting as hard. It doesn't change the fact that they were just as inconsistent, but they were still sort of the engines we once knew. Now then, how does Series 9 fare in looks and sound? Now here's the twist. I actually really like what they did with the sets this time around. Yep, I'm just as surprised as you are. Me being positive about the set design in the hit series? Who would have thought? Okay, so what's different this time around? Did they start using more of the wide spaces and add more background additions that aren't just trees? No, there's still plenty of instances of just empty countryside and not much in them. Okay, so they stopped using the gimmick of the week locations, right? No, there's still plenty of those to be found. Oh, by the way, you know the airport? You know, the one that took an entire special to build? Nowhere to be seen. It's almost like filming Calling All Engines in Series 9 back to back created unnecessary problems. <coughs> <coughs> so what's the difference this time around? The experimentation with different aesthetics. This was something I glossed over in Series 8, but the hit era really liked trying out different looks for their episodes. In Series 8, they mostly stuck to episodes set in Spring, Summer and Autumn. Only once did they try out something new, and that was the Autumn aesthetic in As Good As Gordon. For the most part, it was simple, because they probably just wanted to get their reboot series off the ground. This time, however, we've got plenty more. There's your typical Spring, Summer and Winter episodes, but we've also got Autumn, Autumn with Frost on the ground, and an episode that starts off with autumn trees and dark clouds, and ends with everywhere being covered in snow. And thanks to the return of the narrow gauge engines, whose railway has been reformatted to somewhat be based more in the mountains, we get more varied locations with it, like the snowy mountains in Scarlowy the Brave against that beautiful sunset, very nice to look at. The hit series sure loved those sunsets as well as the nighttime episodes. The dark but beautifully mysterious scope of the Magic Lamp's misty mountain forest, very atmospheric. We also get another Halloween episode in Flower Power with the creepiness factor turned up to 11. The familiar sights of Sodor shrouded in mist and darkness, they have never looked so hauntingly stunning. Even if Thomas being covered in flower creates an unintentionally scary shot. Most of the episodes are set in the standard sunny daytime look we're used to by now, so the variety isn't that big, but I'll give credit where it's due to the production team for experimenting with Series 9. That said, not a fan of how the shots are starting to feel like they're padding out for narration time. Like, that's always been the case for this series, having montage shots that stretch out so the narrator can explain what's going on, but I guess because the episodes are longer, these bits really feel stretched out. I've nothing to say in terms of narration, Angelus is the same as before with inconsistent accents. You won't be able to pull all the trucks of toys as well as Annie and Clarabel. I didn't expect to see the flagpole down there. And Brandon is just as unfocused and rushed as he's always been. I'm really struggling to say anything new about their performances, but they each give the same old shtick. Which works better to me with Angelus of course, but leaves me with nothing new to add. Robert Hartshorn's score has his familiar character motifs from before and generally upbeat rhythm, but me personally, I could hardly remember a huge chunk of the music he did for Series 9. Not helping is the music he did for the episodes around the narrow gauge engines, where for some baffling reason, every single piece of music used on their railway is played with brass horn. And pulled with all his puff. He started to puff his way back to the yard. How can I prove I'm the bravest? He puffed to himself. Duncan clattered along the old line. It just starts to get so ear grading. Oh, but the Scarlowy Railway theme from series 4 to 7 was overused. They played it so many times. Yes, they did play it a lot, but there's a difference. One, the episodes were much shorter, so the music didn't run the risk of getting repetitive. Two, 
the melody was changed to fit the scenario the engines were in, as music should do. 3. It wasn't the only song that played on their railway, as other character motifs were used. And four, and this is more a subjective statement, but it was actually a good song. Every piece of music for the narrow gauge engines just blends together like a crappy mesh of brass trumpets and tubers. This was never the case when Roberts composed the music for the engines in their Series 7 episodes, so what happened here? Was it a deliberate choice on the behalf of Robert? Was it Hit not giving him enough time or freedom to work with other instruments? I've no idea. The new songs for music videos don't help either. I'm sorry if these songs have their fans, but I have nothing on them. They just repeat the same chorus over and over, only to raise the pitch slightly at the end to make you feel more energised to sing your heart out for the ending. When really, I'm just falling asleep. The Brave song says that Thomas is the bravest and knows what must be done. Are you sure, mate? Are you sure? Are you positive? Togetherness is a song about Edward and Henry, my two favourite characters. So what else is there to say about the production? Um, I didn't spot any instances of stock footage off the top of my head. There were some instances of the whistles getting mixed up. That's to be expected at this point. Oh yeah, this is the first series to have the episode names read aloud by the narrator, with the UK dub featuring Angelus reading the titles aloud as the episode begins. Percy and the oil painting. Thomas and the rainbow. Thomas's milkshake muddle. Thomas, 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 Thomas. Can you move it along? I'm all out of Thomas, guys. The half an hour format introduced by Hit is the same as always. I didn't bother with the learning segments at all this time because I have shit to do. And weirdly, a new addition to this format is not only the recomposed Series 7 episodes, but also recomposed Series 6 episodes, complete with new narrations by Michelangelis to fit his narration style of the era. Edward cheerfully buffered up, and the strange train set off. Edward cheerfully buffered up, and the strange train set off. And these versions are... okay. They chose to adapt some of the best moments of Series 6 in my opinion, so I probably have a bias, but I'll still prefer the original dubs. So overall, the presentation is a small calibre above Series 8 with its experimentation in aesthetics, but still carries a lot of the tropes that hold it just somewhere in the middle. It's not ugly, but I wouldn't call a series overall beautiful if only a few episodes are standouts to me. This time around, there weren't as many episodes that enraged me, they just made me bored. But I do have a certified list of the episodes that I would never watch again. Number 5, Thomas's Milkshake Muddle. A childish plot where you can tell exactly where it's going and only seeks to make Emily out as an annoying instigator. Nothing is interesting, new or fresh, and I feel so sorry for the poor sods at the bakery who have to lift those giant churns of butter out of those trucks just for making bloody cakes. Like, it's not milk anymore, it's butter, and enough of that shit can be heavy as fuck. Number 4, Thomas and the Rainbow. Again, a plot that is needlessly dragged out, has Thomas abandoning his work for no justifiable reason, and then tries to make us think he's been ignoring his friends when he's just chasing after a rainbow. And the ending is all sorts of cheesy. Friends are the most wonderful thing of all. Send this for an Emmy. Number three, Toby feels left out. An episode that has Toby acting as his most babyish and unintelligent. He is an old engine to a point where he could be considered for a museum, but he's mentally a child trying to avoid talking with the fat controller like he's avoiding a teacher in the classroom. You can't have it both ways, Simon Brown, or Hit, whoever decided to write this in the first place. Number 2, Reneus and the Dinosaur. A silly story concept that has two of the most respectable, wisest characters on the island acting like complete and utter children. 
the moral is force fed and the constant droning of the brass horns don't help it to stand out at all. I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. Number 1 Thomas tries his best. Weirdly this episode doesn't do anything bombastically bad like a poor portrayal of a character, but it's number one on my list for being the most skippable episode I have ever seen from Thomas and Friends, as it copies a concept already done in the last series yet somehow being more bland and stretched out. I was just left so empty when I finished watching it. Skip. Now the top five. Number five, Bold and Brave. It was nice to see Bill and Ben separated this time around, and the set design for the spooky tunnel under maintenance was surprisingly well done. I like what this episode accomplishes with giving Thomas a unique dynamic with Ben of all characters, and how it helps him later on. It's just nice. Number four, Respect for Gordon. A good moral to teach kids and takes full advantage of that seven minute runtime. Neither side is completely right or wrong for how they behave, and Gordon's crash is pretty good. It's a fan favourite and I can totally see why. Number 3, Flower Power. This episode, as I said before, is hauntingly stunning. Not only that, but it's actually pretty funny as well. I genuinely like seeing Diesel take the piss out of Thomas's fears and while yes, he is scared, he also becomes increasingly annoyed. Ooh, Thomas. Stop it! I actually hold this episode above Halloween from Series 8, <laughs> I'm not kidding. Number 2, Percy and the Oil Painting. Another great moral to teach kids in an episode that makes good use of the Three Strikes formula. Percy feels 100% in character and his outburst at the famous artist is both humorous and feels earned with how we've grown to really see the artist as a snob. The ending subverts expectations and is just, overall, great. Number 1, Duncan and the Old Mine. Of all my top 5 episodes, I found myself going back to this episode the most. And while it has the issue of the constant brass instruments for a narrow gauge story, it's an entertaining episode. Duncan is 100% true to his character and seeing him in a dark and scary location we are not familiar with makes this quite a mature episode for the hit era. Definitely my favourite episode of Series 9. Series 9 is completely, utterly, without question, mid. If I ever gave review scores, this would be a flat out 5 out of 10, no doubt. Every great thing it does, such as nice experimental aesthetics, impressive shots on a few occasions, one creative new character, and moments of the old favourites feeling in character in the few great episodes it has to tell entertaining stories with, is held back by the same character inconsistency problems as last time, wide open flat set designs taking up a majority of the episodes, droning brass music for the narrow gauge episodes, the wasted potential of most of the new characters, and the stories that are either silly or boring. With every good and bad episode from series 9, the rest are just brand flake episodes served to us in a basic bowl with no pleasing patterns on it. It helps to make the diamonds shine a little bit brighter, but it also makes the shit smell all the more stinkier. It's not a promising but ultimately frustrating letdown like Series 8. There was definitely a notable step up, but the overall package just leaves me so... mixed. I don't love it, I don't hate it, it is a solid but mediocre adventure. And aside from those few good episodes, I don't see myself coming back to this one for a very long time. Yeah? Oh yeah, that. Uh, I've been meaning to talk about that actually. Uh, because these reviews, uh, you know, come out so far apart from each other, I've decided to leave out saying, you know, see you next time for these reviews, because otherwise people are just left waiting an eternity, <laughs> you know, between uh, when these reviews are made. So, yeah, not too sure how to end this. I should probably move the body.